right. Technology is as helpful as it always is, so I've had to go to a backup something that is much, 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 much older. So it might not be as clean as I want it to be. We're going to be okay with that. Is it still okay? Can you still hear me? Yep. We sure? Okay. Well, for the first song, if you would like to look up the lyrics on your phone, you can. It's trading my sorrows, but we've done it a bunch, I think. So on the chorus, <coughs> you can join me. If you don't know the chorus, it's yes, Lord, 30 times. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, Lord, and we'll do it.
welcome to church. I don't know if I said that. Welcome to uh, Justin UNC. We're glad you're here and outside. this morning and uh, I know you guys uh, worshiped outside for a whole summer in 2020 but this is my first time doing outside worship with you so uh, this is a beautiful space to do it isn't it um, we had some bubble emergencies you know all right so uh, we're gonna do uh, worship obviously just a little bit different today you don't have any bulletins to have in your hands uh, uh, we're going to um, uh, begin with our time of, of scripture, and I'll, I'll offer a message, and then we'll do some prayer, and then we'll, we'll sing a little bit, and, and we'll be done for the day. And um, today is our monthly birthday party with the pastor, so if you're a June birthday, you're invited inside uh, and downstairs for um, some treats and some birthday conversations. And if you didn't get... Um, have a birthday party with the pastor uh, this year because that this is the 12th and final one of the cycle. We're looking at doing some unbirthday parties in the fall for those who uh, the schedule just didn't allow. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Um, so uh, this morning I'm going to be reading from uh, Genesis chapter two. Uh, we're in the garden, so what a perfect uh, place to be in the garden. Uh, so if you uh, open up your Bible and uh, you are reading straight through, you might realize that the Bible begins with the book of Genesis. And uh, Genesis chapter 1 has this huge bird's eye view, uh, eagle eye view of God creating everything. So there's these six days of creation. God makes light from darkness and forms the earth and populates the skies and the seas and the land. And then God rests on the seventh day after the first recorded work week. If you keep reading, you'll notice that Genesis 2 has a different focus, and we think it might even have a different author. And Genesis 2 zeroes in on God's creation of creatures. And instead of making humans last as the pinnacle of creation, God makes a human first. So I'm going to be reading from Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 25, and let's see what happens. On the day the God, Lord God made earth and sky, before any wild plants appeared on the earth, before any field crops grew, because the Lord God hadn't yet sent rain on the earth, and there was still no human being to farm the fertile land, though a stream rose from the earth and watered all the fertile land, the Lord God formed the human from the topsoil of the fertile land and blew life's breath into his nostrils. The human came to life. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east and put there the human he had formed. In the fertile land, the Lord God grew every beautiful tree with edible fruit. And also he grew the tree of life in the middle of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flows from Eden to water the garden and from there it divides into four headwaters. The name of the first river is the Kishon. It flows around the entire land of Hebron, where there is gold. That land's gold is pure, and the land also has sweet-smelling resins and gemstones. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It flows around the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris, flowing east of Assyria. And the name of the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the human and settled him in the Garden of Eden to farm it and to take care of it. The Lord God commanded the human, eat your fill from all the garden's trees, but don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, because on the day you eat from it, you will die. Then the Lord God said, it's not good that the human is alone. I will make him a helper that is perfect for him. So the Lord God formed from the fertile land all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky and brought them to the human to see what he would name them. The human gave each living being its name. 
The human named all the livestock, all the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But a helper perfect for him was nowhere to be found. So the Lord God put the human into a deep and heavy sleep and took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh over it. With the rib taken from the human, the Lord God fashioned a woman and brought her to the human being. The human said, this one finally is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She will be called woman because from a man she was taken. This is the reason that a man leaves his father and mother and embraces his wife and they become one flesh. The two of them were naked, the man and his wife, but they weren't embarrassed. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Of the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts. Remember the first time that you were told that women can't be pastors? Do you remember how old you were or who told that to you? Maybe no one had to tell you. It was just a conclusion that you drew because you never saw women in leadership in the church. Or maybe you can remember the days before the General Conference of 1956 granted full clergy rights to women. That was 67 years ago. And in fact, I looked it up, that was just a few months after my father's parents were married to one another. I myself grew up in a bit of a bubble when it came to female leadership in the church. When I grew up, my church always had two pastors, a senior and an associate. And uh, we had two different female associates as I was growing up. And when I went into my senior year of high school, we got our first female senior pastor. So when I felt my call to ministry at the beginning of my senior year of high school, there was never a doubt in my mind that God could call a young woman to be a pastor of a church. The first time that I ever imagined anything to the contrary was the summer after I graduated high school. I had a crush on a boy, and I told him that I was going to be going to college to be a pastor one day. And then this cute boy who had been raised in a conservative evangelical tradition, looked me right in the eye, and he told me that he did not believe in female pastors. And I did not know what to do about that. I'd never been told that before by anybody, much less somebody I had a crush on. It was a moment that reoriented me to this Christian tradition to which I was being called and made me realize for the very first time that my biological sex would create barriers to being able to live out my calling. Within the text of the Bible are passages that you can read to make it say anything that you want. It can support slavery, racism, homophobia, sexism. And the reading of the Bible to support women not being called to ministry, it all begins with how we read the story of Eve. When you think of Eve, you probably think of the next chapter of Genesis, where Eve is tempted by the serpent, she gives in, she drags her husband into the whole mess, and they receive curses from God and are banished from the garden. The very name of Eve is tied up with the eating of the forbidden fruit, and the idea of the temptation of sex and lust, although that really has nothing to do with Genesis 3. Eve might even make you think of sin, which isn't named in scripture until Eve's sons, Cain and Abel. But what about the creation of Eve? What about her first appearance in scripture? I think we don't focus on that story very often. We don't tend to think about the positive, faithful elements that Eve has to teach us about what it means to be a woman or human, I should say, what it means to be human, and what it means to be made in the image of God. <coughs> Rather than a reading that subordinates Eve, what can we see in this text that lifts up women and our need for a connection, all of us, with one another? 
in Genesis 1, God is remote and all-powerful, creating entire ecosystems with simple words. But in Genesis 2, we see God roll up their sleeves and get God's hands dirty. Literally, God plays in the mud and makes the first human, who we call Adam. Adam in Hebrew means human, and Adama means soil. In Aramaic, Adam means red clay. So the name of the first human is a play on words. The first human was made up of earth, of clay, of dirt. Adam, earth stuff. God made the first human out of the dirt and breathed into him the breath of life. And this here is the ancient Jewish answer to why humans are different from birds and animals and fish. Because God has breathed into us. We hold a divine spark inside of us and we are made up of part of earth and part of heaven. And then God gives the first human a job to be a farmer in the garden. The first human was a farmer. How many farmers do we have in worship today? And I know we've got even more in the congregation. God also gives the first human a boundary. There's two trees not to eat from. You can eat from all the rest of them. Don't eat from these two. And then we get God declare, and then we, and then after God has declared everything good in Genesis 1, if you read it, everything finishes each day, and it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. For the first time, God declares that something isn't good for the human to be alone. This right here is the basis for a lot of my theology, a lot of my understanding of who God is and who humans are and who we are called to be with one another and with God. God says, it is not good that the human is alone. Throughout the centuries when we've read Holy Scripture, we've chosen which passages to elevate and which ones to kind of ignore. And this is one that I've been called to elevate. God's words that it isn't good for a human to be all alone. It isn't right. And God seeks to rectify this. And the speed and the energy that God uses to make sure that the human has a helper should show us the importance that God places in not doing life alone. Enter Eve. Eve becomes the helper that Adam needs. With Eve's creation, what was not good becomes very, very good. God's creation of a woman becomes part of God's creation of community. For the first time, the human speaks in scripture because he has someone to speak to. Unlike the animals and the birds and the fish, he recognizes that divine spark, that combination of heaven and and earth in this second person that God has created. Of course, it is Eve's placement as the second of creation that adds to the sexism that can be read into the story of Eve and of every woman in the Bible. But I don't think that that's the point that was being made when the ancient Jews were reporting the story and trying to tell a bit of who their God was and what God was all about when the world was being formed. Rather than subordinate the woman this story shows how men and women are intimately tied up with one another, how we need one another, how we are one people, both made from God's messy, dirty, bloody hands. I think we can read this as a story reminding us that men and women were both made by God's hands, both blessed by God, and that we need one another for the world to be good and right. In Adam's first speech, the first words from a human in scripture, he calls Eve woman. But the better word is wife. And the word for himself is husband. Those are relational terms rather than man and woman, husband and wife. Now that there are two people, they are bound up to one another. There's no such thing as a one person alone because they have one another. There's a point A and a point B. That's the blessing that men and women have to one another. And over and over again in scripture, we can see women be blessings to their families, their communities, to their God. 
Their stories can be overlooked because they can more often go unnamed. Because the revised common lectionary leaves them out. And because of the accidental and intentional sexism that can go into our Bible reading. We're going to look at more of their stories this summer. Flawed, imperfect, brave, uncertain, all faithful women. And they all start with Eve being made by God's careful hands because the world just wasn't right without another person to be with that first human. He needed a helper. And this is another case where we can use the Bible to suit our agenda. Because there are some ways that we can read this word helper to imply that a woman's only place is to help the men in her life, to never take the lead, but to calmly and quietly get the side work done so that he can march into battle and take over the world. But that ignores the original language and another way that we can read and understand the first woman's role as a helper. The word here is Ezra Kanego. And it means someone to be beside the human, to be his opposite, to be his counterpart. In other places in scripture, Ezer is used to talk about someone taking a role of active intervention, especially in military contexts. Ezer Kandango can mean a strong, it can mean a rescuer. In Psalm 30, we get an example of the use of the word Ezer to call upon God to be a helper in times of difficulty and trial. That's not subordinating God. That's recognizing God's power to help and sustain when going through a hard time. It's because it isn't good for a human to be alone. We need others, and we need God to be our strong rescuer. In so many stories in our Bible, we see women as being strong rescuers, partners with the faithful men in their lives. And we can get the same thing in media, celebrating fantastic real life and fictional humans. My own husband, Chris, is a Superman fan. And he says that he always loves Lois Lane because she can get herself into and out of trouble. Last week, Ben and I went to go see the new animated Spider-Man movie, and we got to see more of Gwen Stacy, a strong partner and rescuer with Miles Morales. Just a few examples. I can remember how I felt when I was first given an indication that some people didn't believe women could be pastors. And I remember how shocking it was, because I was raised in a tradition that celebrated the faith of Eve. The creation of women as strong helpers and rescuers who were made in God's image and made to work alongside the men and others in their lives. And I feel humbled and blessed to be appointed here to help raise up other young girls in the faith <coughs> so they can get to be told that they're called by God too. In fact, I was thinking about this last night. Uh, this is maybe the third decade of having a woman appointed here to this church. <coughs> We've had lots of, of women going into this church. Man and women. Made in the image of God. Blessed by God. In community and relationship with God. <coughs> given domain over the garden at the center of all creation. The way that God intended for the world to be. Let's try to reclaim a little bit of that paradise in our own lives in this garden today and seek to teach our sons and daughters, granddaughters and grandsons about the faith of Adam and the faith of Eve together. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for an opportunity to be outside today in your beautiful creation. We thank you for the flowing waters that remind us of the waters of baptism where we were claimed and called and loved. We thank you for the wind whipping through us, how it reminds us of the Holy Spirit, your spirit that blows where it may blow, call us to new and unexpected places, and cares for us through it all. As we reflect on the first humans 
and how you lovingly made them from dirt and from one another, we thank you that we were made in your image. We long to do better at loving our neighbors and working together with them as one people called by God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we're going to do our uh, time of joys and concerns right now. We're going to do it a little bit different because uh, we're not going to pass around a mic. So I'm going to ask you to turn to people around you. Uh, maybe if you want to move uh, a little further away from people that you came with, or you could stick with them, whatever you want to do. And I'd like you to just share some of your joys and concerns with those gathered around you. You could talk about uh, also what we call um, in the um, United Methodist Church, uh, God sightings. So where the places that you've seen God at work, that you see little, little exciting little moments where you say, oh, God's at work there. That was wonderful to witness or be a part of. So you got some time to talk to one another and bless one another. Are you chilly? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. No, that's Chuck. Okay. He's got a younger okay. gal. Okay. Now, where does he live? <laughs> okay, so he's here now.
style just like well, it was. It was cold. I guess I didn't see that. You had that <laughs> I didn't see that. It was right in front of me. Was it? No. Okay. Oh, yeah. That was fine. Still one more song. We got to sing now. Four. 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 Man. 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 Three tractors called this humongous semi. That's quite funny. We never had any masses when I was growing up. We had all of them. John Deere and a few international, mostly John Deere. Little tuck down. You know, the old tuck down. That's what I grew up on. And it was neat because what I could do with it is there was a definite cadence to it. So I could sing to the tractor, and I could set the throttle, so I could set the cage. It's like a metronome, you know, a metronome, like a metronome, like a metronome. And so I could set that. My dad stopped me. He goes, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm using this to sing to. You're going to have to sing faster songs, and we're not going to get the farm. Yeah. <laughs> Honest to God, I used to do that. That's my cadence. We had a lot of them. Stop the top my head. My little brother David lives in a hay farm. North of Cooper. Used to hang out in Cooper. Or I used to town in Cooper. Ride the bikes over there. Yeah, yeah, and about a quarter off the back. Yep. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> He's picking one thought. Yeah. <laughs> Before we left, he was like, should I do a call? Come on, Donna. And I was like, wish it. I should be that. Yes, Good to see you. Did you have a I would hope that you would know, do a small thing of it is, yeah, for sure. Right. They don't have enough of it, like the coast right. 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 So no matter if they're just, I don't know. She's a male. It's a way. Stereotypical. She's always the one that says, we don't need that. Yeah. Let's ask anybody. They need some some. This is funny. The noise, you can tell. That's another thing they've got. Okay, here she goes. Now is they've got these wet wagon flashers on the front. These guys are going down the road. Well, I'm sorry. Kind of call us back together. Louder. Yeah, because he adjusted it back to himself. Now it's me. Um, does anybody want to shout out any uh, God sightings or recitings that they shared or talked about? Yeah, it's kind of hard to play. I don't know why I want to do that. Yeah, maybe. Esther Weaver is going to be 104. When is her birthday? August 12th. August 12th is her birthday. 104. I've got a 
message from uh, Kurt Nelson uh, late last night that Millie is in the hospital. Mm. So she's, she went in late last night and wasn't feeling well. Great. So we need to pray for Millie Nelson. Uh, make sure that you are uh, keep up with the weekly update, um, see what the calendar is and everything going on. Uh, we do have the offering box uh, over here if you uh, um, haven't put in this week's pledge yet. You can always give online as well or just bring in a check. And, uh, let's, uh, let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Got one more song to send us out, and like I said, if you're a June birthday, what, what you got there, Noel? Uh, this is another reminder. The main breakfast this week is going to be on Thursday, rather than Friday. Uh, last night was my birthday. Breakfast is going to be Thursday the first Friday. Celebrating Bob Tucker's 95th birthday. And Okay. <coughs> Hello, check. Yeah. Sounds good. You're going to sit there? Okay. We have one last song, and then we're done. Uh, and if you're looking it up, it's Everlasting God. Um, done this a couple of times. But uh, we're glad you guys came out and braved the, uh, the elements. I, I'm just bored with how chilly it is today. Um, was not expecting this this morning. But it didn't rain. So you know what? That was the only prayer I had right now. Because I didn't want any of my stuff to get wet. <laughs> Other than that, all right, well, we're glad you guys came. So many shining faces. We'll sing this last song. We'll say hallelujah, and we'll uh, get on about our day. I have a trouble with this song because I always want to go really fast because I like that. But I can't sing that fast. Thank the rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. And that's not fun. Sorry. Yeah.
Those are awesome, Teddy. So I guess to quote what Heather usually says at the end of every sermon, go forward to, what is it, do justly, love, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. So, amen, and have a great Sunday. Thank you.